Okay, folks, welcome to day one of enzyme mechanisms. This is where stuff starts getting real fun, and I hope you agree with me. So here are the learning outcomes for the day. We'll be able to differentiate between the enzyme active site, binding site, and catalytic site. It's time to jump to the specifics. We're going to start to recognize the types of chemistry that our groups can do. We will start connecting mechanisms that we learn to each other because we want to be able to recognize themes and similarities. And then we'll also begin to talk about ways that enzyme active sites stabilize reactive intermediates or the transition state, and in particular, charges. Today's Meet a Scientist moment is Rana Dejani. She is Associate Professor of Biology and Biotechnology at the Hashemite University in Jordan. She does GWAS studies on diabetes, cancer, and stem cells, and GWAS is genome-wide association study. So she's looking at like a lot of genetic data to find specific genes that are always linked to diabetes or cancer, for example. But she does more than just her science, which I think ties in really nicely to like the mission of this institution. She's also an advocate. So she has advocated for a law in Jordan supporting stem cell research, which is a type of research she does, and also stem cell therapies. So that's pretty cool. Let's jump into it, folks. Let's talk more specifically about enzyme structure. So within an enzyme is a region called the active site. This is where substrate binds and undergoes a reaction. Now within the active site, there are kind of two sub locations that are distinct from each other. There is the binding site, which is related to Km. This is where substrate binds. And then there's the catalytic site, which is related to Vmax. This is where the reaction happens. And so I wanna point out, folks, we're gonna see this in a bit, but I wanna point out now that these are two distinct locations that's kind of understand that the binding site is specific to Km, whereas the catalytic site is specific to Vmax. Um, it's kind of challenging to see in this picture, but I've shown you an image of this. So here is a substrate bound in an enzyme active site. This region here is the catalytic site, and this region here is the binding site. But both of these are contained within the active site. Today, we're really going to talk about acid base catalysis, and we'll see a small example of covalent catalysis at the end. So acid-base catalysis comes in a variety of flavors. We can have just basic general acid catalysis where we have some type of proton transfer or donation. Now when we're thinking about enzymes as catalysts, we have to keep in mind, right, we're lowering the transition state. So how is that happening? Well, if we protonate a leaving group, for example, we could make it easier to leave and more stable. That would definitely be a catalytic mechanism of an enzyme. Or general base catalysis, we can have the enzyme grab a proton. Maybe we need to deprotonate something to make it more nucleophilic, right? And in some reactions, reactions that we'll see today, we have concerted acid base catalysis. So we have proton donation somewhere, the same time that we have proton accepting somewhere else. And our groups are very good 
at performing acid-base catalysis. If you check your amino acid handout, you'll see a wide variety of R groups with a pKr. That means that R group can donate or accept a proton. There are some, of course, that are better at this than others. Aspartate, glutamate, histidine, cysteine, tyrosine, and lysine are the most common choices to do acid-base catalysis. Now, the general rule, as I mentioned, is that the amino acids need a pKr to do acid-base catalysis. And this is largely true. But at this point in time, I'll give you a reminder way back to the day where we learned about amino acids and how the environment can affect the pKa of an amino acid. This becomes important because some amino acids don't have a pKr on the sheet because they don't or can't accept or donate protons, but some amino acids don't have a pKr listed because it's just not biologically relevant. But if we put that amino acid in the right environment, its pKr might become relevant, and we will see that today. Finally, folks, to wrap things up before we jump into seeing a mechanism, I want to introduce this idea that we should already be familiar with. So catalysis is strongly pH dependent. Why is this true? Well, let's imagine that we have an R group, um, let's say we're working with aspartate, right? Let's say aspartate's pKr is about 4. And let's say that physiological pH is 7, right? If we think way back to our understanding of buffers, we'll understand here that pH is way, way, way more basic than the pKr. If the pH is way, way more basic than the pKr, we're assuming that this aspartate molecule is likely 100% deprotonated. So could aspartate do base catalysis, give up a proton, or excuse me, uh, base catalysis accept a proton if it's in an environment where it's likely to be deprotonated? Not really. The pH is so basic that aspartate is going to be unwilling to be a base and accept a proton. In contrast, can aspartate behave as an acid catalyst? Well, at this pH, it is deprotonated. It has no proton to donate. So it can't really do acid or base catalysis at this pH. But instead, let's say that the environment caused the pKr to be more like 6.5. Now, the pH is within one pH unit of the pKr. So rather than looking like I've drawn it, aspartate is going to behave differently. We are within the buffering zone. Aspartate could be found deprotonated or protonated when pH equals pKa plus or minus one pH unit. If this is true, aspartate can now more readily do acid or base catalysis since we're so close to its pKa. So all this to say that any R group can do acid-base catalysis as long as its pKr is within reason close to the pH of the environment. Now keep in mind, as we've just walked through as well, that the environment can determine the pKa, and we will see today how that is very true for some R groups. Next up, we will learn uh, two different mechanisms that share many similarities.